Thank you very much. All righty, Rod, so in three, two. Good afternoon, my name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the October 18th, 2022 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of the committee, at the discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison, may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making a seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Stevens or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the team chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Please note today, Dr. McComas and Ms. Jamison are unable to attend this afternoon's meeting. Therefore, Dr. Holmes is sitting in for Dr. McComas and Ms. Andrea Manna will be presenting the Magnet Program audit results. Ms. Stevens, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you. I'll start with you, Mr. McMillian. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and Ms. Stileski? Here. Thank you. Ms. Hassan? Here. Good. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Here. Thank you. All four committee members are present, Mr. McMillian. Outstanding. Uh, quorum being present, we will we begin? Ms. Stevens, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you. Ms. Barr? Present. Ms. Manna? Present. Mr. Fletcher? Present. Ms. Crew? Present. Mr. Edwards? Present. Ms. Sample? Here. Mr. Strait. Mr. Strait. Mr. Hartlove. Here. 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 Dr. Holmes. Mr. Elmendorf. Present. Ms. Schubert. Here. Mr. Stoll. Present. Are there any other staff members participating in the meeting today that have not been named? Hearing none, I turn it back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Item number three reports. Ms. Manna, please proceed with the magnet emissions audit results. Sorry, I had to get my mic unmuted as well. One second, please. Okay, here we go. So the, for the magnet admissions um, program, we have we do have representatives here from the magnet office that are here tonight to answer questions about their program and their corrective action plan um, after our presentation. Um, we audited the magnet emissions process as one of the selected medium level risk projects within our audit plan. Our objective for this audit was to determine whether or not the magnet program applications and emissions criteria and processes were fairly applied to all eligible students. There were two low rated findings which resulted in an overall satisfactory audit rating. A satisfactory audit rating is the highest of three ratings, and, and the three ratings are either unsatisfactory, needs improvement, or satisfactory. And the audit rating definitions are explained in Appendix B of this report. A satisfactory rating was given for this project because controls are operating in a satisfactory manner and are providing some level of assurance. The risks were effectively managed, and there were no high or medium rated issues identified. Before we discuss the two findings, page one of the report in this section of the uh, of the report uh, presents some commendations for the Magnet Program Office. Um, equitable access is available for all BCPS students to Magnet programs. The seat projections were not exceeded. Um, admissions students were properly admitted. 
and the smart choice application process provided the users, the students and parents, with communications and an easy application process. However, we did note that starting this fiscal year, BCPS transitioned to the focus system software for the magnet application process due to increased costs. So there are three issue rating levels. Let me get to the first one. So the issue rating levels, we we rate each uh, issue in the finding in the reports, either low, medium or high. The issue rating definitions are explained in Appendix A of this report. So the first issue identified in this report received a low rating. This issue resulted from non-compliance with the office's SOPs related to seat projection approvals. In some cases, there wasn't enough as evidence of this approval and the individual school forms were not completed as identified in the SOP. We wanted to note that although there wasn't an indication of approval, none of the magnet seat projections for any high school was exceeded. And this happened because the approvals were submitted electronically via email, and we recommended that all approvals obtained are obtained and documented. Mr. Stoll, would you like to uh, expand on your corrective action plan and, and talk a little bit about that? Certainly. So we ask the schools to identify um, the projected number of seats, and they do that on a form. We provide that information then to the executive directors of the schools for their review and approval and they typically send that back to us electronically. And then the forms go to the director who oversees the Office of Magnet Programs, and uh, that approval, review and approval is, is provided electronically. So our corrective action is to be sure that we save PDF copies of the approval emails um, so that we have them from year to year. Okay, thank you. And move down towards the second issue in the report. And the, the second issue is also a low rating. For 13 of the 30 sampled students who were disqualified, a reason for the disqualification was not noted in the records. And although it's most likely that the student didn't show for the assessment, the reason is not formally documented um, in, in the documentations. Um, this would be important to document to support the validity of the disqualification reasons. And we recommend it that all reasons for student disqualifications be noted for reference. Um, and Mr. Stoll, you can explain again your corrective action plan and a little bit more about this. Certainly. So we meet each fall in, in mid-November with our site-based magnet coordinators to um, plan for the upcoming assessments that take place in December and January. And as part of that meeting, we'll going to instruct the site-based coordinators to document specifically the reasons that a student was disqualified for a particular assessment. And they'll either do that in focus where the scores will be entered uh, for the application process or on a spreadsheet that the schools will submit to our office. And then we'll review that, make sure that the documentation has been made and uh, can keep and maintain those records. Thank you, Mr. Stolen. Um, that's the end of our presentation of this report. Um, if the board members have any questions. Board members, any questions? Yes, Mr. McMillian. Yes, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I, I saw that there was a corrective action plan because the school 13 out of 30 of the 30 sample schools did not include a reason. Um, why the kids, why the students were disqualified and you have a corrective action plan for it. Could you elaborate on how you plan on correcting that? Because we got a lot of emails from parents who were unhappy because their kids were not picked, i.e. either to the lottery system or through the assessment. Sure, I'd be happy to and, and thank you for that question. Um, Typically, there's two reasons a student is disqualified from a high school assessment. Um, the most common reason is that a student doesn't show for the assessment. And if a student doesn't take the assessment, they're automatically disqualified. Um, so we do have some schools who document that, that the student is a no show for those assessments. Um, but we haven't been um, really consistent in requiring all of the schools to provide that same documentation. Um, the other reason that a student would be disqualified is if they were cheating on an exam and the school would 
would document that and then would provide that to us. So our, our corrective action is to make sure that there's consistency across our high school programs where they're conducting assessments so that if a student doesn't show for an assessment it's and should be disqualified that they'll be documenting that so that we have that documentation for instances where parents ask questions about why their child was disqualified or wasn't accepted into a magnet program. Do you have a demographic breakdown in the number of farm students that are admitted in magnet schools overall? Um, and um, ESL students as well, along with the demographic of racial breakup of, of um, and can you provide that to the board? So we, uh, Mr. Elm, Dr. Elmendorf, did you want to address that? Yeah, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Stull, but I believe we can um, provide that that data on what the demographics of the actual magnet enrollment is, um, but that isn't something that I think we have prepared with us today because it wasn't part of the audit necessarily. Is that right, Brian? Correct. That's why I asked if you could provide that to the board so we could see uh, as MAPE has continuously told us to look at everything through an equity lens. Are we making sure that some of our most disenfranchised and um, impoverished children have access to magnet schools? Yes, we're, we're going to be tabulating that information and, and presenting that to the board, um, I believe, in the spring. You, you said in the spring, is it possible to bring it to the board? prior to the spring of what you have right now? So, Ms. Jarrett, I'll chime in. This is Leanne Schubert. Um, the spring data would be reflective of this application cycle. What we could prepare for you would be the students in the last application cycle who were admitted into magnet programs, but certainly that's something we can talk and, and look at for you. Yes, if you could provide the last one or two application cycles, um, the breakdown of the demographics, that would be great. Sure, we can provide that on a Friday update. Thank you, Ms. Joes. Thanks. Ms. Joes, any more questions? No, thank you, Mr. McMillian. OK, the other two committee members, Ms. Tolosky, Ms. Hassan, questions? I have none on my part. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Mr. McMillian, for facilitating this. I see all of the all of the hard work you put in. It's very well appreciated. I loved being able to see this um, and see it unfold in our magnet schools. So thank you. Thank you very much. And and I haven't done a whole lot. It's all these other people. I'm just facilitating this meeting, Ms. Tolosky. Thank you. Um, I have no questions, but um, I also look forward to seeing the report showing how we're um, providing opportunity to all students to access and take advantage of the magnet programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. It's a generalized magnet question, and I'm going to take the opportunity. I'm going to take this opportunity to, to ask for a refresher for me. I realize all the different assessments for the different programs are, are obviously specific to the magnet. But when it comes to the, the percentage of kids that get into a particular program, are we all, are we like at 80%? What's the percentage of the kids that score above a particular score? They get in and then we go to the lottery. Can somebody explain that? For, just help me again with that, please. I can explain the process, Mr. McMillian, and I'm not sure if Mr. Stoll is able to provide actual numbers, and certainly um, okay. if, if he's not, we can get that in, that's, a, that's okay. in an update. So at the high school level, the majority of our high schools do have an assessment component related to magnet admissions, um, and um, there's a couple of tiers to that process. Um, and Mr. Stoll will chime in and virtually kick me if I miss any of the steps along the way. Um, so the first would be a priority placement at the high school level um, if uh, the child of an employee. So that would be um, an employee who works at the magnet school. And if their child scores 80% or better on the assessment, um, there is a priority placement for uh, students of uh, employees at that magnet school. 
Then for our high school students um, with the assessment, we look at the magnet assessment and we look at the scores and 20% of the available seats, we look at the highest scores. So if there are 100 seats in a program, we would look at the 20 students with the highest scores and they would be given a priority uh, placement. Uh, let's say hypothetically, and this has happened, that uh, we have 21 students who scored 100 points on that exam. There is no priority placement given um, because there's only 20 priority seats. Then the next tier down is we look at all of the students, <coughs> excuse me, who scored 80% or, or above, and that those students are then placed into a random lottery. So 80% or above, random lottery. Um, and then if there are still seats remaining, we then look at this, all of the students who scored 79%, we do a random lottery for those students, 78%, et cetera, until all of the seats are filled. Mr. Stoll, did I miss any steps along the way? No, that was that was very well done. Okay, now on the on the point of 21 where there's Todd and they, there's a 21 perfect scores that you, that just blows me away. But so there's no perfect placement or no uh, preferential placement for those 21. But then they all become lottery. That's correct. Currently, that's how the um, magnet rule is written, sir. And, and that's an unusual case where we wouldn't be able to fill any of those priority seats prior to the lottery. You know, it's more likely that we would fill a portion of those by students that we could identify as earning those highest scores. So we might have, you know, 17 kids that earn a top score and then, you know, we're able to place those prior to the lottery in the next three seats because we have a tie of more than three students who can fill those seats. Those would end up going into the lottery. That's that's more of a typical example. OK, and and. So all the different programs, all the different magnet programs go by this. This top preferential placement, then they go to the above 80 and and if seats are available, then below. So all of them go by that, correct? All of our high school programs, right? OK, and then if the, the programs that have the physical component, whether it's a dance component or maybe it's a singing component that I'm unaware of, but wouldn't be surprised. And and that part of the assessment, how do they how do they? So part of it's going to be an exam, uh, a written examination, I'm assuming. And then the other piece, the physical piece, those two are scored. Uh, those are scored and then and then combined to get this particular score. Right, so. Most of our high school programs have a an assessment as well as an academic evaluation, and the scores from those two components are combined into a single score. Um, for those programs, most of those programs have paper and pencil type of examinations. Um, our three art schools do performance based assessments, Milford, Patasco and Carver. And for those programs, there typically isn't a written component. Um, it's a performance based assessment, which may include an interview of the student. Um, and the teachers are the are the folks who adjudicate those assessments. And we typically have at least two adjudicators for any performance to make sure that uh, you know we're not giving a, a score that's either extraordinarily high or extraordinarily low. OK, and uh... How about something like the International Baccalaureate? How is that a similar kind of process? Right, so they use a, a paper and pencil test um, and they also have the students write an essay. Um, and we provide all of that information to the parents about what the assessment components are and what we refer to as our assessment guidelines that are posted on our website for every program. So uh, the assessments vary significantly from school to school and program to program, um, but we provide those guidelines so the parents know what to expect and they provide information about how students can prepare. Okay, and, and, and I'm, oh, I'm go sorry. ahead, please, please go ahead. 
What Mr. Stoll just shared applies to the International Baccalaureate Program at Kenwood High School. We also have an International Baccalaureate Program at Newtown High School. Newtown came in, as many board members might remember, as part of a federally funded Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant. They are pure lottery, which was one of the requirements of the grants. So Newtown's IB program is a pure lottery program. And, and I'm sorry to ask these questions, but I just see the opportunity to share this information with the public. Uh, you know, if the public's chiming in and they see something, you know, an audit on the magnet school programs, I just think this is a, is, is a time to do it. Uh, now that we've mentioned the high schools, can somebody elaborate on the middle schools? Yes. I can take that one because it's an easy one. <laughs> All the middle schools and elementary schools are lottery. Isn't that nice? Low hanging fruit okay. question there. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. And I'll go back to my script. Uh, Mr. McMillian, I, I just yes. wanted to add one thing. I know we the previous question was about equitable access to the, the process. I just wanted to reiterate, and maybe someone from the audit team wants to do this as well. That was one of the commendations. Commendations was that we had um, equitable access to the, the magnet process. Yes, Dr. Yep. Elmendorf, this is Andrea Barr. I was waiting until all the uh, board members, and I see Ms. Joes put a, uh, that she has a follow-up question, but I was going to end with that. We did look into the process, into the magnet emissions process. We reviewed all the SOPs. We reviewed board policy. Um, we had the list of the students, everything that was being presented this evening, we reviewed, and so as a result, this is our report. We had two issues. They were they both received low issue ratings and the overall audit results are satisfactory, which is the highest rating that um, that can be received, um, as we explained earlier. So I think that we felt very comfortable with the emissions process, with the cooperation that we received from uh, particularly Mr. Stoll and Yes, and uh, Ms. Manager scrolled to the commendation. So again, equitable access, that was that was high up on the list. That was number one. Just the seat projections were not exceeded. Um, all students were properly admitted to the magnet program. Again, the only issues that we found were the two issues that were noted in the report. So I wanted to reiterate that and make sure that the, the, the committee felt comfortable with the um, audit and the audit results and the work that the magnet program folks are doing. Ms. Barr, thank you very much for adding that. Ms. Joes, your follow-up question. Thank you. You did ask a couple of my questions, but um, my question is there's two high schools, Eastern Tech and Western Tech, correct, that have a actual assessment that needs to be completed for um, magnet school admissions. What are the farm percentages of those the, that two schools? That's something that you can easily provide, I, I would say, in a couple of minutes. But what's the farm percentage in Eastern Tech and Western Tech? Do you know? We do not. Um, so let me just follow up, Ms. Joes. Um, many of our magnet high schools have assessments associated with them, um, including Eastern and Western. Um, farms data, I don't have that available off the top of my head, but again, with the additional data you requested earlier, that's something we can provide to you. Are we providing farms data on the school websites? Or I know it was provided prior to the ransomware. Is that something that's still available? I have not seen it recently. don't believe so, but I am checking right now. Mr. Stoll, it appeared to me that you were going to say something, but your microphone's on mute. Am I inaccurate? Um, I was going to say the same thing that Ms. Hubert had said. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Joes, I am not seeing farms data on the school school's website, but we can certainly get that those data for you. Can you provide that, Mr. Elmendorf, in the um, other data that I requested as well? Definitely, yep. We'll do that in a Friday update. Thank you. Sure. Right, thanks. Okay, moving along. Thank you very much. New business. Ms. Barr, please proceed with the FY23 first quarter work plan and investigations update. Are you able to see my screen? 
Yes, I am. Yes, weekend. OK, because it looks like my uh, I'm muted. OK, um, so <clears throat> we have now to present to the audit committee our fiscal year 23 quarter one work plan update, and I'm just going to go over the audit focus areas. And then when I'm done going over the FY23 audit focus areas, Mr. Fletcher will then present his FY23 quarter one update related to the investigations. So as you'll note that for the division of the chief of staff, we have no audits planned in FY23. So the first audit that we are working on that is in the reporting stage as of September 30th relates to the Office of Payroll, and that is a carryover project from last year. And once we got into the project in this year, we actually um, changed it to the audit of manual payrolls that happened to occur primarily during the summer months. So we um, have requested management's responses and they are due in our office this Friday the 21st and they are on target to provide those responses to us and our intention would be to, to bring this report uh, to the committee next month at its November meeting. Uh, as of September 30th, again, with respect to the Office of Purchasing, we're in the information gathering stages related to looking at contracts, agreements, and, and leases. With respect to um, the ESOL and new immigrant registration and enrollment process, we're pretty well into the fieldwork stages of that project and getting closer to uh, the reporting stages uh, this month into the beginning of next month. We have not yet started the CTE accreditation project. Um, the homeschool program, we're actually completed the field work for that project uh, related in the Office of Educational Opportunities. And if the report is done, we may be bringing that as well to the um, committee next month. You just heard the magnet program and admissions process audit. We issued that report on September 30 actually of of this year. We have not yet started the Office of Special Education dispute dispute resolute, excuse me, dispute resolution project um, as of September 30th, but we are in the planning stages of the student enrollment and registration process and related professional development. We actually have um, the entrance conference scheduled for that either this week or next week. Um, with respect to the programs and services related to health barriers, um, we have not yet started that project. And with respect to student residency in the shared domicile processes, we are just in the fieldwork stages related to that project. With respect to um, the Division of Human Resources and the Office of Staffing, we um, are heavily planning an audit of recruitment, hiring and retention processes for certificated staff. We actually have been doing a lot of research and, and background and data gathering um, related to those three areas. We do have a, a meeting scheduled, uh, information gathering meeting scheduled for tomorrow related to this project. With respect to um, the hiring processes for temporary employees in the summer program and substitutes, that has not yet been started. We are in the process of looking at the MSDE certification process, and we have received information back um, from the Department of Human Resources related to that project. With respect to the Office of Benefits, Leaves and Retirements and the Employee Wellness Program, I need to call to the committee's attention that we met with um, the individuals responsible for this program and we made a determination that it does not make sense at this time to audit this program for a variety of reasons. Um, the program was basically um, suspended since about 2019. There were just a few different types of things offered virtually and the individual that's now going to be responsible um, for the, running this program probably has about a week into being a, a Baltimore County Public School employee. Plus, they just hired a new um, benefits manager. So we felt with all the reasons that were provided to us, 
it just made sense to defer this project. So what we've done is we are going to defer it and we are replacing it with an audit, another low risk audit related to the use of facilities in Baltimore County Public Schools. With respect to the discrimination claims process and ADA accommodations, nothing had been started as of September 30. Um, with regard to IT security, that was a carryover project from last year, and we've made a lot of progress with regard to that project, and that is still ongoing. I'm not sure exactly when we can project that that project will be complete, but we have obtained a lot of information and documentation that we need related to that project. Um, with respect to the student data applications and reporting, that is in the planning stages, and I believe we do have an entrance conference scheduled for that uh, within the next two weeks. And with respect to the cloud environment and SAS applications, nothing was started uh, at all as of September 30th. With respect to the SRO program in the Office of School Safety, we've met um, quite frequently with Ms. Lewis and, and her group, and we have made a lot of progress with respect to the field work for that project. The next two, with respect to school safety measures and um, change orders in the department or the Office of Facilities and Construction, they have not been started as of September 30th, nor has the Office of Transportation bus routes as of September 30th. And then with respect to the Office of Law, the Records Management, we issued that report on August the 22nd, and we do plan, and that will be on the agenda for next month's audit committee meeting. And we also have general office responsibilities that are ongoing that we complete every month. For example, I do meet regularly and monthly with the superintendent, with the chief human resource officer, uh, with the Office of Law General Counsel. I actually just had a, had a, a meeting with the new risk manager. We have our monthly staff meetings and uh, weekly progress meetings with respect to projects. And we also attend um, staff development activities and we are implementing our new cloud-based software application teammates. So we do a lot of different things that are considered general office responsibilities. So for right now, that completes my overview of where we are at the end of quarter one for FY23. I also wanted to mention that even though projects are noted as not started, every single project in the plan has been assigned to an auditor or an audit team. Ms. Barr, thank you very much. Ms. Jones has a question. Certainly. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Um, I see that generally we are moving to a cloud based system and saving all of our records. There is a record retention still in place that was issued by this board, I believe, in 2019. How does that, if the cloud based applications that we're going to be using, is that going to make it moot? And how would that help? Uh, it, it won't make it moot mute because um, there are still record retention requirements related to electronic records and electronic files. And uh, we do know that um, the transfer of responsibility for the records management has moved from the law office uh, to the Department of Information Technology. And perhaps at our meeting next month, we'll have more information to provide to you and they can update where they are with that transition. But it, it, it does not go away. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Joes and Ms. Barr. Uh, committee members, any other questions? Hearing no questions, Ms. Barr, will you introduce Mr. Fletcher? Sure, Mr. Fletcher, are you ready to present your FY23 quarter one update related to investigations, please? Yes, ma'am. Let me share my desktop here. OK, so everyone should be able to see the Office of I'm sorry, the Office of Internal Audit Investigative Unit FY23 Q1 report, correct? Yes, I can. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. <clears throat> so to go through and again, uh, this is for the first quarter of FY23. Uh, so we're, we are speaking uh, July 1. 
through September 30th. And during that first quarter, during that period, uh, we did go to our first table here. We did receive 26 new cases uh, in through our hotline. And of those 26, six were kept uh, for investigation by the Office of Internal Audit. One was actually referred out to BCPS management for their review and disposition uh, and then provide response back to us. And then 19 of those 26 were actually outside the purview uh, of the hotline. So there were, uh, there were cases that we were received, but they were not necessarily fraud, waste, or abuse. Uh, typically those are management issues, things like that, that we provide to management uh, for them to review, but we do not ask for replies or responses back for those. And so those are the cases that came in uh, during Q1. And then when we jump to table two, go down here to our next page, we actually take a look at uh, the total workload, caseload, if you will, for quarter one. And so in addition to the 26 new cases that came in, we started with 13 that were already open as of June 30th. Uh, so as of the end of uh, FY22, we had those 13 added in the 26 new. And so during that first quarter, uh, we did have 39 cases that were open uh, during that period. And when I when I say open, I mean open, not necessarily received, but open and, and worked, if you will. So of the 39, uh, and, and I'm actually focusing here on this uh, left side of this bottom chart, of the 39, uh, 16 uh, were investigated by the Office of Internal Audit. Um, 11 of them have been closed as of September 30th, and so five remain open. And so for these cases here, they're actually provided in detail here on table three. So table three shows first the 11 that were closed, and then at the bottom shows the five that remain open. Then going back uh, here to table two, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, for management investigations, we did have one uh, that is open during the during the quarter, and that is still open as of September 30th. We were awaiting management's response for that. And then our memos to file is this third column here. I'm sorry, for the management investigations, details for these cases uh, are here, or for this case, I apologize, are here on table four. Uh, to, to show you the detail there. And then for our cases that we received that are outside the purview of the hotline, uh, again, not necessarily fraud, waste, or abuse allegations, uh, we had 22 cases uh, that were open throughout the entire quarter. As of September 30th, 17 of those were closed and five uh, remain open. And then these uh, details for these 22 cases are here in table five. Again, starting with the closed, and then we have the remaining five that are still pending. And so this uh, information has already been provided to you via board doc. So as you review any of the detail, if you do have any questions, uh, we are certainly available to, to discuss any of them. But Mr. McMillian, that is our presentation for our Q1 investigations. Thank you very much, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, any questions, board members? Hearing no questions, I want to thank Ms. Stevens for, for providing to the board members uh, the farms data uh, for Eastern Tech and Western Tech. She posted that under uh, the chat for us, so thank you very much for that. Any, any additional questions? We're going to move to announcements. The next meeting of the Audit Committee will be on Tuesday, November 15, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. I just want to thank everybody for helping to contribute to what I view as a very efficient meeting. Uh, and it's, 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 it's not me. It's the people behind the scenes that are putting this together uh, and doing all the work and, and all those different pieces that that make this presentation the way it is this whole committee meeting so i want to thank everybody any additional questions okay 
Our meeting is to an end. Thank you very much, and we'll see you on November 15th. Thank you.